It takes a special breed to be a truck driving man and a steady hand to pull that load behind. Mr. Gifford thinks I'm going somewhere, but I'm not. Hey, shush. Shush. So I'm out here in the truck, getting all my insurance stuff and licensing in here. So these are my annual oversize overweight permits. And I get a lot of questions all the time about, you know, out west here, how we come, we have, you know, we've got so many axles and we're so long. So this permit right here, is a seven axle permit. So what that one is, is the scraper Jeep and the dolly. So on a black route, which would be I-15, they'll give me 147.5. Purple, which is gonna be some state roads, 136. And then you get into blue, green, orange, and yellow. Those are state roads. Hey, shush. Um, those are some roads that don't have they're not in very good shape so they don't have a lot of um weight capacity on them so that's the seven axle and then we'll go to i think the next one here which is gonna be a six axle so <clears throat> the six axle is the murray trailer here we got the D9 on it back here, as you can see. So that would be the trailer without the Jeep. So you got you got your steer axle, you got your drives, you got your tandems on the trailer, and then your stinger axle. I'm gonna go back and show you how that stinger works. So with six axles, my max weight is 148,000. And then this is my eight axle permit, which is the Murray. Omega with the Jeep trailer on and on a block route I can get 183,000 which I never get there so what I have to do is each one of these weight categories um, generates a overweight mileage report and I have to go on the internets hey shush um, and I have to go in there. And so this eight axle permit generates one, two, three, four, five, six reports. And every one of these permits has six different weight categories. And with the state of Idaho, because you pay like a 10 mile tax, um, the more axles I have, the less... 10 mile tax I pay so when I'm hauling the D9 around I'm gonna be probably in the well actually when you go to the weight reports on the state's website these particular weights don't come up if I remember I mean I've got one in here that's like 160 or 155 so with this, with Killdozer on, uh, with wore out undercarriage and stuff on it, the D9 weighs 104,000 uh, net. And then my tear weight is about 50,000. So I'm at like 154. So I have to bump up and get up to the next category. And to haul the D9 around, I pay 44 cents a mile. Um, and like the 336, people say, well, oh, you don't need eight axles to haul a 336. No, we don't. But the problem is, is you'll put 50,000 pounds on the tractor drives and I can legally do that, but it's a lot of weight. And when I do that, if I went to a six axle, I'd be in the dollar something a mile department. And so with the 336 on... Um, I'm going to be like 130,000, which drops the mill rate way down in like the 20 cent a mile department. So there's an incentive there to, uh, carry the load with the most axles. And then 
uh, since I've already done this permit years ago and I just renew it, these are my axle spacing. So I'm 14.5 from the steer to the drive. I got a 4.7 separation between the drive axles. Then I'm 15 foot eight to the Jeep, the 16 tires. And I got a four foot six spread on those. And people don't want to know, do they give me anything on this? Yes, they do. Not like California, but they do recognize all those tires. And then I got 31 feet, three inches from the Jeep to the trailer axles. And they're a four foot eight spread. And then I got 14.9 between the trailer tandems to the stinger. And so basically the way that mechanical system is set up on the back, uh, if I've got 44,000 on these tandem trailer axles, I'm gonna have exactly half of that on the stinger. And Murray was pretty smart about how they set that up and how it works. Uh, I used to have a functioning air scale back there for the stinger, but it don't work anymore. So, <coughs> um, I've just never got, a, I've never had an overweight ticket. I got plenty of trailer, plenty of axles. I just have to be careful where I go. And somewhere in the book here, I have a route capacity map. And I believe I did a video on Instagram using my Bill Clinton pecker pen to explain the route the route capacities and it shows the highways in different colors and that's how you know what what a black purple green yellow red route is so you've got to watch where you go anyway um, So the way this works is, see that walking beam there? And then you've got that big pivot point there. That pivot point is this subframe. So none of the trailer weight goes in, on top of that walking beam unless you unhook the stinger. And then inside here, there's two big metal blocks and you slide them over and they go against this and then that would put all the weight on that so if you don't have a stinger it will distribute the weight evenly on these two axles but the way it's set up now is this comes here and there's a pivot point right here so all the weight of the trailer comes back here and by doing that you end up putting half of the weight that would be on those two axles, so if there was 44,000 on there right now, the stinger would have 22,000. So you'd be at uh, 66,000 over the three axles. And with the amount of spread you have here, that's easily doable and you're legal. So that's the way this works. This is a mechanical stinger. Um, and then this has air ride on the back. If it didn't have air ride, it would just beat that sign off and that didn't sound right. <laughs> My biggest problem <coughs> that I have is it beats and shakes and it knocks these outside marker lights. It then does the uh, connection that hangs out there. And I don't, I don't know if there's a wire in here or what's happened, if it's broke. Yep, it broke it off, so I get to fix that again. Anyway, this trailer is all made out of A514. I'm assuming that's what they're using, or you can, there's a brand name, T1. It's kind of like, you know, you can call a Kleenex a facial tissue, but everybody calls it a Kleenex, and so everybody calls this T1 when it's actually a 514 it's just a high carbon steel alloy steel and it's like a spring so you can see it's taken the camber out of the deck and sway bellied it and that's what makes these trailers so light so the 
the whole setup empties 50,000. And a trailer that didn't bend like this was just made out of pig iron, heavy steel and wouldn't give, would probably, you'd be probably pushing 65, 70,000. And so that's why they cut all these holes in it. You, to lighten them up. You don't, you don't need that in there. It's, it's high strength steel. So this is where the deal that, uh, the air scale for this back went and it was all rotted out and beat to death, beat off, you know, so I got rid of it. But right now it looks like I need to, I need to weld me some little studs in here and get me some zip ties and get these hoses and stuff put back in here to support them and all my protection fell off here so i need to get that fixed up and these all put together so that they're not wearing because eventually they will eat a hole in them so i need to find out uh what i'm gonna do with this today i need to call a customer and see if I can go get get this down to Aberdeen and get started on his job. We got another job. We need to go move the 336 too. So things are picking up. I'm getting busy. Um, hopefully Matt gets here and gets his truck done, so I can get that baby in the shop. I really wanted to leave yesterday, early morning Sunday, and get my ass down to California and get that hose press. Um, and then come loop up around through Oregon. I got to go to corn in California, which is toward the northern part of the state. So I need to go up over Donner, I-80. And I'm going to stop in Petaluma and visit my friends there, Vic and Lauren. And then go on up corn and get the press. Then come through Oregon. Or I mean, go up to corn and get the press. And then probably come back up through Oregon and down into Napa to uh, Advantage Machine to get the rods for the ripper cylinders and the dozer cylinders and then I can get that stuff together and then I need to get this thing in the shop and get working on the steering clutches get the converter out go through that go through the tranny hopefully everything's good in the uh rear end ring gear and pinion but i need to go all go through all of that because i'm not going to put it all together and then end up tearing it apart because i got a problem now i'm not sure but i think i've got a pinion seal on this left final that's leaking because when lauren and vic went and looked at it i think when they took that plug out and you can see it's leaking some this final's clear full and what happens is the transmission oil leaks through the pinion they use a, a dual cone seal which is a, a seal a metal seal and i'll show you that it's the same kind of seal they use on the rollers and the final drives they're a pretty good seal but um anyway inside there is a seal to keep the transmission oil out of the final and it's obviously leaking whether the you know that o-rings inside all that you know, hot transmission oil and over time it's going to cook that rubber and then the seal's going to leak it's usually it's usually never the metal face that leaks it's always the rubber o-ring that gets cooked so <coughs> i need to uh figure out what i got going on there fix that anyway while i'm at it it'll all get blasted and painted and cleaned up made to look brand new and i and i need that hose press because i got a lot of hoses to build there ain't a hose on here that's any good not a one anyway my plan is to basically rebuild this into a good reliable tractor i got good undercarriage i do have some body and fender work to do i got to take the hydraulic tank off and i'll go into that and clean it out and make sure everything's good and while i do it i'll probably pull this fender off take it to somebody with a 100 tonner press or bigger see if they can straighten that out but in order to do that i got to take the rollover support off and that unbolts out of the frame probably ain't been out of there since the factory and that might be fun to get out 
because the factory sure in the heck doesn't use anesthesia or anything and the other thing i'm going to do while it's in the shop is i'm going to pull the whole hard nose off with the radiator go through the radiator fan drive bearings check everything up there and then put it back together as far as engine work goes uh, i hadn't really planned on doing anything other than maybe take the valve covers off and check the rocker arms make sure they're all good and then just run it um last thing i want to do is scatter that engine all over the shop floor and work on it not what i want to do so anyway i'd also like to find some track guards for it not the cat ones but the spokane steel forge ssf ones they're better than the cat ones they're way heavier duty so if you guys have a line on some good ssf track guards let me know uh so far everything i bought is because of you guys that one the d9 out there oh the tracks in minnesota which i still gotta go get all right mr griff you ready to go do something productive you gonna go do something productive